The processor or CPU is the brain of your PC, but what does this mean? Which processor should you buy for your PC? What are the differences between AMD Ryzen and Intel processors? Can an old $10 processor compete with $200 processors? These are doubts you might have if you are thinking of buying a new computer, but also if you want to learn about the components of a PC. For this reason, today we are going to review all the keys related to processors so that you are aware of their importance. We have done dozens of tests for many hours to check all this, so you don't have to. This video is part of the Build Your Gaming PC 2 series, where we go over all the keys to the different components of a PC. Check out this playlist to learn all the keys to the other components of a PC. I hope this video is what you were looking for, and I wanted to emphasize that it has been possible thanks to your support. If you want to see more videos like this on the channel, it is vitally important that you subscribe, since the vast majority who watch the videos are not subscribed, and bringing relevant content is complicated if our community does not grow in numbers. See also the description to follow us on other networks, such as TikTok or Instagram, and above all, add our Amazon and Components affiliate links to your bookmarks. That way, despite paying the same price for your online purchases, you will be contributing directly to this channel. As with the motherboard, the processor has a socket with a certain size and characteristics. It is important again that the socket of your motherboard and processor match, otherwise it will be impossible for them to fit and the PC to work. Intel and AMD have different sockets that are also in constant evolution, since every few years they are renewed to support new processors. Intel has a much more recurrent update policy, since every two generations of processors they usually launch a new socket, so that previous processors cannot be mounted on the new motherboards that are launched, and you cannot reuse your previous generation motherboard if you have bought a new processor. AMD has been more flexible in this regard, as their AM4 socket lasted four generations of Ryzen processors. Now they have launched a new socket, the AM5, in order to support new technologies such as DDR5 RAM or PCI Express 5.0. Hopefully they will keep this socket for a while, as they themselves have shown that it is possible to stretch the life of a socket beyond two generations of Intel. Processor performance is in many cases determined by the number of cores and threads. How many cores and threads do we need today? How do you know if your processor is causing a bottleneck and you are losing performance? We have tested different processors to demonstrate all this, and you can be amazed by the results. For the tests we have a very unorthodox range, but you will see how it will serve us perfectly. First we will be comparing a Xeon E5 2620V3 with 6 cores and 12 threads, with an E5 2670V3 which has 12 cores and 24 threads, twice as many. They are mounted on Chinese X99 motherboards and the RAM is capped at 2133 MHz, unfortunately. These are Xeon server processors, compatible with Socket 2011 V3. Unlike a normal desktop processor, Xeon processors have a completely different focus. Why is this? It happens because server processors are designed to handle more intensive workloads and multiple tasks simultaneously, while desktop processors are designed for fast single-task performance. In addition, server processors often have additional features to increase their reliability, security, and virtualization capabilities. Moving on to the tests, in Cinebench 23 we can see how in the multi-core test the Big Brother takes advantage of the extra cores to almost double the points of the 2620v3, and is placed more or less where Ryzen 7 1700X, the first generation of Ryzen that came with 8 cores and 16 threads. The most interesting test is in gaming, and here I have compared these two processors, but each one I have also tested with two different graphics cards. First to RX 590, which was the one I put in the best cheap gaming PC of 2023, which we tested recently in the channel. I leave you here above that video which is super interesting. Then also the RTX 4070, which is a super top high-end graphics card that just came out and is going to squeeze these processors to the max. But, why do we test a high-end graphics like the RTX 4070 with 10-year-old XEON processors that cost 10 euros? Well, 
because it is the best way to see if that extra cores makes the 2670 better able to support a high-end graphics and consequently to see if the number of cores matters when a gaming PC is limited or has a bottleneck in its processor. Let's start with Fortnite and the split screen in 4. The graphics configuration is competitive and the resolution is 1080p. The important thing here is to know that in the four tests the configuration is exactly the same, only the processor and graphics change. On the left you have the RX 590, with the RTX 4070 on the right. Meanwhile, on the top row you have the 6-core Xeon 2620, and below you have the 12-core 2670. We see the performance differential in percentage between the two processors, and the results we see corroborate what we were talking about. In the case of the RX 590, both PCs perform similarly, so the processor is not a limiting factor. Or at least not as much as we see in the 4070, where there is a more substantial difference. If you notice, the Xeon 2620 pulls almost the same FPS with the RX 590 and the RTX 4070, an infinitely more powerful and newer graphics card. This is because the processor is at its absolute limit, already with the RX 590. The Xeon 2670 is doing much better, although it suffers a lot with the RTX 4070. It still causes a huge bottleneck. To verify that the same would happen in other games, let's run the Cyberpunk 2077 integrated benchmark. In this case, the game is set to medium qualities and 1080p in all cases. I know that the RTX 4070 could run this game at higher resolution and graphics quality, but by lowering qualities the processor will be more demanding, and that interests us in this case. In the case of the RX 590 we could try running the game at 720p, but I don't think anyone plays like that, and I was interested in showing more realistic results in this case. Battlefield 5 is also an interesting game to test, as it puts a lot of demands on the CPU on this Rotterdam map. We run at 1080p on high, to see how the RX 590 and RTX 4070 perform. If you're wondering what the bottleneck is, this is exactly what we see with the RTX 4070. We see how the processor is working at 100% to send all the information requested by the graphics card, and we can see that it is not enough, because the graphics card is far from working at 100%. This is a disaster in a gaming PC, and indicates that the PC is poorly balanced, in addition to losing a lot of performance that the graphics card could give. We see much more difference in favor of the 2670 in the test with the 4070. Running the game in 1080p, with a super powerful graphics card that supports much more graphics load, the processor is a huge bottleneck. Seeing this, we can say that having twice as many cores has helped us a lot. On the RX 590 the bottleneck caused by the processor is significantly reduced, as that graphics card generates much lower FPS in 1080p, and consequently is much less demanding for the CPU. But this is not the end of the tests, we are going to add a third processor to the test, which is the i5-12400, the one I use in my personal computer. A processor for a home PC with 6 cores and 12 threads, in addition to clearly faster frequencies, exceeding 4 GHz as turbo frequency, while the Xeons were running at about 2.6 GHz during the tests. If we run Fortnite again with the same configuration, we see something very interesting. We have a huge improvement if we pair the RTX 4070 with the i5-12400, as you would expect. Meanwhile, the RX 590 pulls even more performance accompanied by the 12-core Xeon processor. Very curious to see, leave me a comment if you understand why this happens. Obviously it can always be due to the particular gameplay, so let's problem more games. If we now run the integrated benchmark of Cyberpunk 2077, something very similar happens. Again, the improvement that the i5 gives us is huge in the case of the RTX 4070, while in the case of the RX 590, the result is even worse. It doesn't make too much sense, but I swear I've tested it several times. In Battlefield 5 something different happens, and in both graphics we see noticeable improvements when mounting the graphics with the i5. However, seeing the tests, 
I think that a last generation processor or with more cores would have been good, since this i5-12400 also suffers with an RTX 4070. This game is a killer for the processor. What we can establish from what we have seen is the following, from a certain number of cores, at least from 4 or 6, it does not matter so much the number of cores and threads that the processor has, and it becomes much more key how fast those cores are. In video games and with graphics cards that are currently low-end like an RX 590, the processor does not matter so much either, because the graphics card itself is the limiting factor. But in tests with the RTX 4070 the difference is more serious. We can see that this graphics card does need a processor that is up to the task in order to bring out its full performance. But beware, we are taking the PC with the RTX 4070 to an absurdity. Nobody buys that RTX 4070 for 1080p gaming. Let's put this 12-core Xeon 2670 and i5-12400 again to the test, but in this case at the maximum resolution of my ultra-wide monitor, which would be 3440x 1440p. We could say that this RTX 4070 is meant to run games at these types of resolutions, which in this case is somewhere between 2K and 4K, so this test is going to determine if this Xeon can measure up to an RTX 4070 in a more realistic scenario. Next you will see on screen the results obtained in the same games, but raising in all of them the resolution to 3440 by 1440 and the qualities between high and ultra. With this we are considerably increasing the graphics load of the game, and consequently, the graphics starts to be more important. The RTX 4070 is not as overpowered in these scenarios, and therefore, it is not asking the GPU for so many FPS of refresh. This lowers the dependency on the CPU, and that is why we see less difference between the 200 euros i5 and the 10 euros Xeon. So, how many cores do you need in your processor? Can a 10 euro Xeon work for your new gaming PC? There is no definitive answer, because as we have seen, depending on the components with which you accompany the PC, it could completely change the answer. We have also seen how a recent 6-core processor blows away older 12-core processors, and we know that a current 4-core, 8-thread processor can be very beastly for video games, with examples such as an i3-13100 that is beastly for gaming. Therefore, we can conclude that the speed of the cores is in most situations much more relevant than the quantity. If instead of knowing in depth each component you want to know which are the best gaming PC configurations by parts of the moment, do not miss this playlist. Every month we are releasing a new video with the best quotes of the moment, so you will have a very recent video waiting for you. While you're at it, if you've made it this far in the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a like. It's free, but it's a huge help to us. The frequencies of your processor are another of the main keys that determine its performance. In the end, it is one of the basic characteristics that establish the speed of a processor. We have just said that in many cases it is more important to have a few fast cores than to have many cores, and the frequencies are one of the major indications to determine the speed of the cores. The frequencies indicate the refresh rate that the processor has to execute instructions. That is, it indicates the number of operations that a processor can perform every second. The higher the frequency, as long as stability is maintained, the greater the number of operations and the greater the processing capacity. Raising the frequencies of a processor is possible, and in fact it is a very common practice called overclocking. As the name itself indicates, it is based on raising the clock frequencies, and consequently, the number of cycles that the processor can complete each second. Generally squeezing processors and raising their frequencies usually implies a rise in power consumption, and consequently, also in temperatures. It is a question to take into account, since the increase in power consumption requires a more powerful power supply, as well as a higher quality VRM on the motherboard, while the increase in temperatures also requires a better dissipation system. If you want to know what is the best way to cool the processor of your gaming PC, do not miss the video on CPU heatsinks, as there we compare options such as liquid cooling or air heatsinks. Be careful, because it is possibly one of the most important accessories for the proper functioning of a processor.
The architecture of a processor refers to the internal structure and design of the chip, including the number and type of processing units, the organization of memory and the way instructions are executed. Each processor manufacturer has its own proprietary architecture, such as the x86 architecture of Intel and AMD or the ARM architecture used in mobile devices and Apple, for example, in its laptops. On the other hand, the manufacturing process of a processor refers to how the chip itself is physically constructed. The manufacturing process includes creating layers of silicon, etching circuitry, and incorporating special materials to improve conductivity or durability. Each manufacturing process has its own size measurement, known as the node size, which refers to the distance between components on the chip. The smaller the node, the more transistors can be placed in a given space, which translates into greater processing power. Manufacturing processes also affect the energy efficiency and speed of the processor. For example, newer, more advanced processors typically have a smaller node size, which allows them to run faster and consume less power than older processors with a larger node size. AMD has already released processors built at 5 nanometers with the Ryzen 7000, and Apple is already moving to 3 nanometers from TSMC, which is the leading manufacturer. The silicon limit is said to be around 1 nanometer, so many changes in new materials are expected in order to continue advancing. Cache memory is a high-speed, low-latency memory used to temporarily store the data and instructions most frequently used by the processor. Cache helps improve processor performance by reducing the time the processor needs to access data and instructions in the slower main memory. The cache is divided into several levels, each of which is smaller and faster than the previous one. Level 1, L1, is the smallest and fastest cache, which is located inside the processor, while Level 2, L2, and Level 3, L3, are larger and slower caches, which are located outside the processor core. AMD has developed a cache technology called 3D Cache, which is found in some of its newer processors. 3D Cache technology uses a stack cache structure, which allows the L3 cache to take up less space on the chip and increase data access speed. This has proved to be a remarkable breakthrough in gaming, with processors like the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D or the new Ryzen 9 7950X 3D, which are true beasts that have come to surpass Intel. With all this we have the keys to the processors that you can find in the market. Keep an eye out if you want to know the best processors today, and if you want to see the most updated Intel vs AMD Ryzen comparison on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, because that video is also about to come out, and it will be the bomb. For now, if you liked today's video, I would greatly appreciate a like, a comment, and your subscription. It will give us strength to continue publishing top content like this. That said, we'll see you again, see you next time, bye!